Welcome back to Collective Couch Conversations, a candid series on leadership and organizational development. I'm Rebecca Ume Crook, and I'm here with Jilly. And today we are talking about learning design and facilitation. Oh, yes. Um, so, in the time I have been at Metis, from the time I was a fellow, cohort three, um, yeah, I've always admired how you deliver sessions, how you are in rooms. And when I think of the moments that stand out to me, one of them was during retreat. Uh, this was, I think, at the court seven retreat, I want to say. And we had this session about a why sandwich, which was, which was about storytelling. And something that stood out was how you are reaching out, especially to the people who aren't speaking much, purposely trying to reach people who are struggling. So can you tell us a little bit about why that's important and how, we, the, how that came to be? Because usually we're all like, yeah, the quick ones, and then we go, 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 go. So why was that not the case on that day? Interesting. Uh, thanks for triggering my memory. I really enjoyed running that session. Um, just for context, the, the purpose of the session was to be able to support fellows to be able to tell their, their stories in a clear, concise way, in front of video, actually. And so your question is around how we engage... Engage everyone to mm -hmm. ensure everyone's successful, yeah? Um, so I think there are a couple things. One goes into the planning. So thinking about what, um, what might be potential pitfalls mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. and playing that out in advance so that you feel prepared to field questions or even to... Um, be able to navigate those challenges. So in this case, we created a framework for, for telling a story, which was called the Y Sandwich. And I thought, okay, let me, there are going to be some people who get this right away and are going to be able to like tell their story, go in front of the camera and nail it. And then there are going to be people that are a little bit more confused. And so if I set them out, you know, in teaching, we generally follow, I do, it's called gradual release. Mm -hmm. I do, we do, then you, you do. Mm -hmm. So if I'm teaching you how to do addition, I might do a problem on the board and teach you how to add by myself. Then we might do one together, and then I'll send you off right to do addition mm -hmm. worksheets by yourself, or maybe that's the role of homework. We do the same with adult learning. And so we, I taught the framework, and then there was a participatory part where we got to do it together. And during that session, I often choose someone who feels like they're really struggling. Mm -hmm. And I encourage someone to be brave. Can you lean into our meta values and can you do something hard? Will you volunteer for us to model your why sandwich? And the bonus to you is that then you won't have to do it all by yourself alone in 10 minutes and struggle alone. You'll get the, the support of the collective. Mm -hmm. So... Thinking about that in advance, building that into my session design, then allowed me to find um, struggling learners, in this mm -hmm. case struggling fellows, and then incorporate them to support them. And then we're just building the collective capacity to do things because fellows are pitching in to support, um, and it wasn't all the instruction wasn't coming from me at that point. So that's kind of my thought process mm -hmm. for that particular session. No, actually, I like that you talked about preparation because um, one of the tools we're going to be sharing here is the Metis Facilitation Manifesto. <laughs> yes. yes. So uh, that's also going to be a tool that's available for all of us to use. Um, but yeah, so in, okay, you're in the room, you're having the conversation and actually, uh, again, another memory. Let's walk down memory lane. Um, it actually reminds me more about um, a session we had. This was also at retreat, but mm. with a session that I personally love so much, um, the youth panel. Yeah. Yeah. So the youth panel, uh, for those listening, if you've not been at retreat, is a time where we actually listen for the people we are innovating for, the learners in the classroom, and we get to hear their voices, what they have to say about the experiences they're having in the classroom with learning and all that. And the purpose of that is for us, the people who are innovating for them, to listen and hear their views. Yeah. Yes. So um, we had that particular session, and things started to go sideways. <laughs> you, do you remember, remember that? that. I yes. remember that. So, yep. yeah. Cohort three. Let's lead into Feisty. that. Yeah. <laughs> so if I remember, Julie, what, what happened was we had these young people who were courageously sharing about 
what they would want to see in, in, in a great learning environment and then experiences where they had felt supported and then experiences in school that had not felt good. Yeah. And then we had some, we had many of the adults, um, we just jumped back into our conditioning, which is sometimes we think that we know all the things and mm -hmm. that young people don't. And so instead of listening, we had some fellows jumping in and almost like giving advice or, you know, and it was, right, that's what happened. Yeah, it was kind of, it was getting into like lecture territory of lecture like, territory. are you sure, was, like, this is the thing, and like, yes. trying to, almost like a justification I remember thing. that. Yeah. Okay, so mm. what do you want to know about yes. that? So now, there was a time, because again, in facilitation, you want to, I would imagine, you want to hold the room, whole space in the room. Mm. Um, and when this conversation was going, that said, what are the, the things you're engaging, or rather, um, how are you going to bring that conversation back to where it needs to go, holding true to the outcomes you had set sure. for the goals yeah. of that session? Yeah, yeah, okay. So this can happen, right? You have a perceived idea of how you want a plan to go and, and the goals, and, and you might even have norms for how you want people to show up, and sometimes participants don't follow those norms um, or we forget them or there's a breach or you know we go sideways and I think in that situation and you'll remind me if I did this well <laughs> or effectively or not um, but I think it was to, to pause everyone and, and just call it out and go huh okay and like not with 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 some grace not trying to shame our fellows but go oh it seems like we're doing this thing where instead of listening, we're, we're speaking over mm -hmm. our kids and our challenge. And that makes sense because that's normal. That's how we're socialized. And the goal for this session was actually that we're going to listen and learn. And to just say that quickly and to say, so I wonder if in our comments, instead of making a comment, we could ask a question. So give people an action step and... And I think that that, without shaming, is a quick one, two sentence way to get people back on board. Um, I think, you know, <laughs> I think that did the trick in that situation. Sometimes you have learners who do feel a little antagonistic mm -hmm. and, you know, there, there are a lot of resources I can share just around the least invasive way to get back. Sometimes it's just proximity. Like you don't even have to, you know, mm -hmm. you might have a noise maker, you know, <laughs> you know the ones, <laughs> you know the ones, okay, just, just, just go walk by them. You don't have to even, um, say their name or call it out. So pro the first is proximity. The second is then, you know, going just a quick reframe of the instruction. So I need everybody now with their videos on. Oh, I can see Muthoni has her video on. KK has his video mm -hmm. on. Steve has his video, you know, and you narrate the positive of what you want to see. So if someone's not doing that thing, they kind of get back. And this is, you know, I'm a for former kindergarten teacher. This works for five-year-olds. It also works for 50-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be like, Julie doesn't have her camera on. Nah, 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 nah. You're just calling out the good. Um, then if there's something really distracting, you're just going to be like, I notice not everyone um, opened their textbooks to this. I'm using a very teacher example, but <laughs> opened their textbooks yeah, to this. Yeah. Re re reminder, we're going to page 60. So it mm -hmm. could be a lightning quick mm -hmm. correction. And then, yeah, so you kind of scale it up depending mm -hmm. on the situation. But you do want the least invasive because you want to focus. As a facilitator, your job is to tend to the collective energy and mm -hmm. I think that where we put our attention grows mm -hmm. so if you put the attention on the one person out of the room of a hundred who is detracting or is on their phone or whatever mm -hmm. then all of the energy immediately gets sucked there but if you celebrate what is I feel like that continues mm -hmm. to flourish so that's been a guiding principle for me too no actually I will say you handled it very well because also in the room we had people who are like much more experienced teachers like yeah. years and years and years upon uh, like our own even as facilitators yes there are I, elders so our fellows yes. are elders in many cases <laughs> it's true yeah so um yeah I think uh, how you approached and it's a one I've had you say, um, if you call it generous authority, yeah. I think that is. Yeah, yeah. so like mm. leaning into that a little bit more, I found that it was really important because what I saw you do is that you actually acknowledge the experience that that person is coming with and showing them that this is a different perspective that they can also pay attention to. And I felt like that kind of helped 
smooth things along and help people understand what was going on. So very much yes. <laughs> yeah, Priya yeah, Parker, yeah. generous authority. Whether you're hosting, whether you're facilitating, you don't need to be chill. Like you're there also to protect sometimes participants from each other. Um, and we're often like grateful for that. I think actually, Julie, I'll bring up one mistake I made one time was mm-hmm. when we were telling our leadership stories of self, there was a recommended time limit of, I think, five to 10 minutes. Yeah, literally five to 10. And mm-hmm. we had someone telling their whole life story, but it was like 30, 40 minutes long. And now we were up really late. Mm. And so now people were getting tired. Oh, yeah, and then yeah. the next day, we were kind of really resentful and tired, myself included. And so what I failed to do as a facilitator then is to hold people to mm. time and to model that and to view timekeeping not as like a militant, negative experience, but something that would be just protect people's energy, ensure that they could listen fully and show up fully um, without getting too drained or tired. And so that's a mistake I remember I made once and we had to loop back and that's Mm -hmm. why norms are also really important. But being a really present facilitator, I think involves, you know, holding to the vision and the norms that you had and steering people back when we go astray. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually that leads me to my next question, the going astray part. (laughs) So now, um, again, as facilitators, again, in METIS, there's times where we are facilitating, of course, with fellows and at events or, yeah, or even like in the small meetings we have. Or, um, yeah, then there's times where we need to also now internal facilitation among, among ourselves. And using the tools we have available to us to solve the challenges we have. Um, And one thing I actually applaud you for is recently where we had to come back to the Metis way Mm -hmm. and we had a team, the team get together and we had challenges that we were looking at. And then that was the time to, hey, we have this tool already, let's get back into it. So I really admired how how you led that session and was getting back into the Metis way. Can you talk a bit about what that experience was like and handling because there was a lot of emotion in the room. Sure. Yeah, it was a really tough day. But yeah, yeah I felt... Well, okay, I don't want to go into what? the What? You tell yeah. me. Was uh-huh. it a tough day? It was. It was. It was a tough day. There were a lot of emotions. And again, we were all trying to see like... it's Because the Metis way is something like we know. I feel like at that time, it was like an intellectualized thing. But it was... I wasn't at that time a living thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. which was weird for me also in the facilitation thing. But... Um, yeah, it was a hard day, yes, and there were a lot of emotions, but at the end of the day, I didn't feel as heavy, so that's yeah. us. Yeah. Mm. So, for context, first of all, every organization goes through challenges. Mm-hmm. This particular one Julie's talking about is programmatically... Um, we're dropping balls. <laughs> so, our, our program team had dropped some balls, Yeah. and... Um, what we did is just come together and talk about it and say, you know, it was, it's just a full day problem solving session, mm-hmm. um, where I thought about the outcomes I wanted in advance, um, thought about the activities that would align us to kind of get to those outcomes and then made a plan around that. So it was very similar to an external session design, except it was for our own team. Mm-hmm. And, we use the Metis way. So we use our own design thinking curriculum to be able to tackle some of the challenges we were facing. And that day, I mean, I'm really curious for you, like what felt, um, what about that day worked for you that it was hard Mm -hmm. and challenging because we had to, we had to be honest about the places that we were letting ourselves down and therefore letting our fellows down in a way. Um, and I think that, you know, based on all the feedback forms afterwards, people felt more confident in themselves, the more confident in their teammates and positive about the direction that we're moving and clear on their own next steps to, mm-hmm. um, right some of our wrongs. Um, what do you think about that day got us there? Um, well, one I think was, um, creating 
like facilitation wise i'm trying to think from both like trained as a facilitator and as an attendee but i felt that it was a very welcoming space for authenticity yeah. um like for the jobs that for the balls that i had dropped i didn't feel like this was a witch hunt i felt like it was a opportunity to be supported yeah. and then it was also a place for um for people to share about how best we can actually get there so it wasn't just like okay there's this thing and then i have this 10 things to do and then i do the things and then everything will be fine it was like a co-creation sure so it felt um yeah a space for authenticity um a feeling of community also and then also like there wasn't like time to like um like overindulge it was like oh here is the thing let's remind ourselves of the tools we have yeah. and engage with them in a new way yeah. even though they are tools that we share yeah. let's ourselves engage with them in a new way yeah yeah Cool. I'm glad that was your experience. <laughs> I, I also think like I tried to do an activity in the beginning with rope that was like, oh, oh yeah, all, yeah, that was fine. Like just an experiential to get us in our bodies and in in our why of why we you know do what we do. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so this also brings me back to another time we had some internal facilitation uh and where things were going astray in mm. programs uh we had dropped a lot of balls uh things were <laughs> things were all over the place um however when we had that challenge um you facilitated as a session based on the metis way yeah and on that day something i found really helpful was um one bringing us together with something that was so familiar to us but something that we could engage with in a new way and the fact that we held space for um everyone's to share their emotions and for everyone to feel at ease like the activity we did with rope in the morning about leaning with each other and working together i found that really impactful mm. so when you're thinking of facilitating especially towards problem solving or mm. getting things back on track yeah. how are you approaching that oh that's a really good question so i I think the same prince like general principles apply whether you're designing for an external session or for an internal session um where you really do think about like what's the need what's what's our purpose who's who is the audience who are there are participants and then then what are the activities that are going to help us like meet those needs learn those things do you know mm-hmm. do what we need to do in this case and so when i was thinking about this particular season and just to be candid right every organization goes through through challenges and um sometimes we drop balls and in this season um we had and so what i had noticed from watching and observing and really listening to different team members is like there was a lot of cl- frustration but we weren't naming it all together. We were like bits of we were either frustrated in silos or frustrated in little like clusters of people but not as a collective and there wasn't like a clear pathway forward. So I think for me it became like okay, the need is for us to lay bare what is true mm-hmm. to be able to allow people to take radical responsibility for the things that they were um not doing well um to be able to express what they would desire going forward mm-hmm. um and then i thought what better way to be able to craft a way forward than to be able to use our own curriculum the meta sway which is a design thinking approach to solving challenges and so i think julie like the unspoken thing to around facilitation and learning design is that i think that it takes it takes some it takes a spaciousness it takes a creativity it takes the ability to kind of carve out some time to be able to think strategically mm-hmm. and i think that all learning designers and all leaders have to create pockets of space where they can breathe where they can look at challenges and possibility and then be able to design experiences to collaborate and learn for it together. So that mm-hmm. that's the first thing. Is first, you know, I was also frustrated in that situation, <laughs> but I had to stop and breathe and create mm-hmm. space um for myself first so that mm-hmm. then I could think about what are the spaces that we need all together to be able to solve this challenge. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. Then, you know, I had identified and listened to people talk about their challenges and um then designed the session that way and I think that 
again, with any facilitation, being able to lean into a shared set of norms before getting the work going is really important. So at Metis, I think we have a really high level of trust and we have our values which really guide our work. So doing hard things, going further together, listening and learning, mm -hmm. redefining excellence and doing small things with great, great love. Yeah. You know, that was also like the norms for that particular session so that we could show up in that way even though it felt like we were doing hard things. Um, that experiential thing, being in our bodies in the beginning, I think is really great. And then using tools that people already know to be able to solve their own challenges um, was really important. I also think there are small things like I'm nitpicky with as a facilitator. <laughs> like how many times have I come into a room and been like, no, 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 we are not all sitting in no, lines. No, no. Like we, <laughs> let's be in a circle. Or how many times is a facilitator? Yeah. Even how we're sitting now. Like I think when we're having these tough kind of conversations and putting all of our challenges up on sticky notes. Like there was a wall of 20 sticky notes yeah. and things that we felt Lots. that were challenges <laughs> for us. And being aware where in the room as a facilitator, I am sitting or standing or, you know, at that point I think I was cross legged on the ground mm -hmm. to just kind of, so I think that's the other thing that's now going into facilitation bit is once now you have your whole plan and your session design, getting to think about your physical space, thinking about how you stand and sit, thinking about how you listen, thinking about those types of things can really shift a room towards a positive outcome even when things are tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, happy to see it came through. <laughs> yeah. Mission we have accomplished. overcome. We have overcome. <laughs> we have overcome. Um, I think the last question also in hearing you speak um, is, again, as a collective, mm -hmm. um, especially when we are thinking about how we gather. We are bringing funders, we are bringing community, we are at events, and then there is that moment to also how we are moving around the room when we are supporting another facilitator at the front. Because for us in fellowship, we have, we are facilitating, advocated, all these beautiful things we are doing. So how, as you as a facilitation team, have you been in a situation like that and how are you navigating that, like facilitating for your fellow facilitator, if that makes sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I think we can all be supporters of a shared outcome. And I think if like you're on lead for a certain session, the rest of the team who's in the room, um, if they're not having to do other work, like, be in it. Support your the, the lead facilitator. And that can look a lot of different ways. But I often find that sitting with participants, asking them questions, participating, sharing, will not only help you contribute to a valuable conversation, but it will also help you pick back information that we can take back. So you're picking up, like, where are people confused? Where are people really thriving? What are great examples that are happening in small groups that maybe we want to share and pollinate across a whole group? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think for a facilitator to be able to leverage on the different people in the room... You know, you know. You look at the facilitation manifesto, <laughs> yes. please. Um, but part of that is being able to create a plan and sharing that plan with other people, so that they know how to be allies with you and to be able to lead a really successful session. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> As Ume has said, please check out the Metis facilitation manifesto. <laughs> yes. Do we want to get into any of that, Julie? Um, yeah, we have a few because it's essentially 10 steps yeah. all through yeah. um, from start to finish. So we can highlight maybe like point form, like sure. one after the other. Sure. And a little bit of history around this facilitation manifesto. I think, again, we all have to facilitate. You don't just have to be on the programs team at Metis or in your own organization to view yourself as a facilitator. You might be facilitating a meeting, a board call, um, a one-on-one. A one-on-one -on -one with someone. I mm -hmm. think it's there are these principles that I think can serve us when we facilitate, and I think that our posture and how we create space can actually profoundly impact the outcome of a meeting, whether it's one person or a hundred or a thousand people. Mm -hmm. So let us see if I can pull this up now. We created this a few years ago. Um, 
And I'll just run through a couple of, mm -hmm. of the principles. You gave me a limit. I'm just going to read the yeah. 10. I'll <laughs> just ten. give you the 10. <laughs> and then maybe you can probe if you have further questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, um, I will say when you look at this, I do say it, this structure might feel stuffy at first, but you can make it your own. And I would just say, try it out because I actually think structure can actually liberate and give you freedom. So, actually, that's something you said. I think you said, was it structure is kindness? No, clarity is kindness. That also. Yeah. Brene, <laughs> yeah. Brene said that. Brene Brown. Oh, Brene Brown. Brown. Rebecca, okay, but yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but I do think structure liberates. So here's, here's, some, here's some structure as you go about thinking about how you design. So the first is begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. okay, so think about what you want your ideal participant to think and feel and do by the time they leave your meeting or session. Right? Think, begin with the end in mind. Um, then define your session objectives. So this is where you get granular. So learners will be able to. Da, 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 da. Are they going to be able to do single digit edition? Mm -hmm. Are they going to be able to tell an impactful story? Are they going to be able to vote on a budget? You know, be be clear about your objectives. Mm -hmm. um, then you create your session agenda. And I find, like, I'm a former teacher. We used to sometimes just like get sucked into Pinterest and be sucked into like, ooh, mm -hmm. what are the cutesy yeah, activities mm -hmm. other people are doing? And then forget about why are we even gathering in the first place? <laughs> so start with the end in mind. Start with your objectives. Then you can think about what are the activities that are actually aligned to my outcomes to, to get us there. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Then you develop your session plan, which is you know a breakdown of your timing, your activities, the materials you're, you'll need. Um, earlier into your facilitation journey, you might want to script some of that. And not that you'll be getting up and reading it, Jules, but sometimes really thinking through what you want to say, how much time it will take, will then allow you to feel so prepared and confident that you can just flow mm -hmm. and be present in the moment. Yeah. Um, is this also like right now you'd put like your plan A, B, and C? So like if this is not working, you have something in place for that? all of the green session plans each. Yeah, you sound like a guru. So having <laughs> contingency plans, really yeah. great. You might want to think through what are pitfalls participants might have, how mm -hmm. do you differentiate the activity for different types of learners, all that good stuff. Put it in the session plan. Yeah. Um, tenant five is to incorporate practice time to test your session plan, mm -hmm. especially... If you are newer to facilitation, we've probably heard that Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours rule. Um, practice helps you. Practice, and again, not that you have to do it the same every single time, um, but it'll build your own internal confidence. It gives your team members also an opportunity to give you feedback. Um, you might want to test run your whole session with a lower stakes group of friends in a brain trust format. Um, we ran the Metis Way with school leaders, and they were guinea pigs before then. We went out to fellows mm -hmm. and had you know them invest their resources. So mm -hmm. so practice, okay, mm -hmm. practice, practice. Um, then six, collect and review feedback. Yeah. I really important, I think, to kind of understand how people are receiving your communication and the way that you do activities. Mm -hmm. Seven is know your content. Um, so whether you're teaching people how to use Asana or teaching people um, how to monitor and evaluate, like make sure you know your content. <laughs> um, you do not have to be the expert, but of what you were trying to communicate, mm -hmm. make sure you feel confident. Do not get up there. Like even even you guys, internal stuff. If you're trying to teach someone, Julie, if Julie was trying to teach us a new breathing exercise, <laughs> she's got to know it before. Okay, so please sure. know your content. This becomes even more important when we have external folks and fellows who are who are coming to this, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, then, number eight. Mm -hmm. Adapt. Adapt! Yes. Okay, so here's this quote from Eisenhower. He goes, believe in planning, but don't trust the plan. It is the planning that allows you, in real time, to adapt to the unexpected and changing circumstances. And I really believe this, that I think that if you plan in advance, then 
then tenet eight is actually be prepared to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Forget everything. <laughs> Learn yeah. everything. Be in the present moment so that it's not like tick tick. Exactly. That's done. That's done. That's done. But now you're present with the people and learning together. Exactly. People's energy, people's wisdom that they bring to the room. Maybe they're five steps ahead of you and you need to adapt your plan because you don't want to be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, be willing to, to adapt and have the only conversation that this particular group of people can have at this particular moment. Um, and do what you need to do to be present so that you can adapt. Mm -hmm. And actually, that actually harkens back to something that we see in the fellowship where you fall in love with the problem, not necessarily the solution. Exactly. Right? So, yes, fall in love with the objectives of your session, not, a, not the activities. The activities. Okay? Yeah. Fall in love with, like, the big goal that you're trying to support people to learn, not necessarily this, the very specific path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The number nine would be to reflect. Mm -hmm. So after your session is done, create space for you to reflect on, like, how did that feel to me as a facilitator? Um, if you've been able to pass out questionnaires and get data and feedback from your participants, it's a good time to look back at that. Mm -hmm. um, carving time for you to think about the thing that you did, in my experience, always helps. It, you know, helps us grow from strength to strength. Mm -hmm. So be able to, to pause um, and document, and even to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the last tenet of this manifesto is to be yourself. I think everyone can be a facilitator. I think everyone can lead. And when I am most motivated, inspired, and learn the most when people just show up as themselves, and so that's going to look different whether you're you know, you bring the Julie energy, whether you bring the Rebecca energy, you know, bring your own self and your energy and, and, and trust that. Um, you don't have to pretend to be someone else. Mm -hmm. um, that's the last tenet. So you can check these out. I think, I really think that they apply again from a, from a board meeting yep. to a big facilitation to in person mm -hmm. to, um, Your virtual, calls, virtual, yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. may may they help you to to lead meaningful learning sessions? <laughs> yes, thank you, facilitator Ume. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Please use the materials. Um, yeah, like in facilitation, you learn, you do the thing, <laughs> use them, practice them. Uh, then, yeah, yeah, adapt it, make it your own. Mm -hmm. Happy thank learning. You.